Well, hello there. This is Virtuosa Chess Noob, learning and having fun with chess. If you've been following my channel recently, you'll know that I love playing the romantic style of chess. Aggressive, bold, bombastic attacks, even if they're unsound, sacrifices for initiative. I just absolutely love that style of chess. Sometime I can go a little bit too far, and that's what happened in this game. Pretty much my attack completely fizzled out in the opening. I'm in a terrible losing position. However, I thought that this game actually was a good demonstration and a bit of a learn, a bit of a lesson on how you can have fun in these games of chess, and also when you're down, when you're losing in the opening how you can potentially use certain tactics and a strategic approach to try to pull back, you know, the, uh, the disadvantage potentially for a win or, you know, in this case, a draw. Well, let's go take a look. I've got the white pieces and I play a Von Hennig Gambit, which means, of course, black plays the Karakhan defense. e4 and c6. Take the full center uh, and now, so d4, d5, knight to c3, captures, and rather than the main line with the knight capturing back, we play the von Hennig bishop to c4, basically allowing the loss of the pawn. Now here, one of the most common moves that black will play, which is also a very, very good move, is to develop the other knight to defend that pawn. But my opponent here plays another very, very good move against the von Hennig gambit, which is the immediate b5. Now I know that this move exists, however I've never really studied it in much depth and I've actually never played against it. Very very few Karakhan players will find this move at the beginner intermediate level against the von Henning Gambit, but this is a very very good move potentially. So if I bring my bishop back this way then effectively I've lost a move. And this is the idea of b5, forcing the bishop to move at least a second time, quite possibly a third time as well. So here I bring the bishop back here because I want to keep vision on the f7 square. Now black now immediately plays a5, and can you see the reason why? That's right, a4 traps the bishop. The bishop has nowhere to go, every single square is defended, now I knew that was coming because I sort of knew this general overall tactic. And the way to really defend against that is quite simple, a4 and basically the bishop can't get trapped anymore. So in its own way this is not too effective. However, as I saw this and as I was thinking about it, I got a very, very evil idea take root in my brain. Which is, uh, and you know one of the things I talk about, always look for sacrifices, is can I capture the f7 pawn with check and sacrifice my bishop, because that will draw the king out, and particularly if in the next move I move the knight first, the knight is also in striking distance of the f7 square, so there's another attacker immediately, and the queen. Uh, these two squares also all look at f7. So I thought there was a potential attack there. Now I didn't calculate all the way down to know whether it was good or not. In fact, I thought it was probably not good. Uh, it seemed unusual for it to be good and for me to not know that this was a particularly tricky line in the Von Hennig Gambit. If it was really that good, someone's name's probably going to attach to it, and as far as I know, it didn't exist. Probably not good. However, I thought that, let's give it a go. Well, let's see what happens. What I've got to lose? A game? What does it matter? So, in this move, rather than playing a4, I decide to take. Get the knight into position. Stockfish hates this, it's a mistake. And one of the things is when you're looking at uh, game evaluations, looking at the Stockfish evaluation metric, is in these positions, you can't really make use of the Stockfish metric because it's going to tell you you're going wrong, consolidate, pull back your attack, and of course, if you were going to do that, you would have never made the attack anyway. These are unsound, uh, very aggressive attacks, but psychologically they can shake up the opponent, increase the likelihood of them making serious mistakes while you're in the place to make, uh, have the, you have the attacking resources in play, that you can make a quick win. Right, they play as expected, a4, correct move, bishop is trapped. But 
notice that they've put all their moves into pawn moves, none of their pieces are developed, I was thinking of sacrificing anyway, so I've not, not really lost a move, this was my plan. Bishop it captures the pawn on f7 with check, of course king will capture, and now let's bring the queen out, queen to h5, check, x expected, the g pawn to g6, and now queen to e5, an attack on the rook. So this was approximately as far as I calculated. I did see that potentially, you know, if they try to defend the rook uh, reactively with the bishop, uh, then here with check, and there are some potential tactics where I could be winning back material, and also damaging all these pawns, king can no longer castle, hole on the f-file, potentially quite good. Good resources. However, this was a daily game, which means I had plenty of time to really, really think things through. They find the best. Uh, they find the best move. It's probably not that difficult to find knight to f6, and I think this is actually the problem with this entire attack down this line. White just doesn't quite have enough juice. Like the attack is just not enough, just not powerful enough, just don't have enough moves, just not enough pieces. So I think. This attack probably actually doesn't work. It's too easy to defend against. Here, I decide to give a check. King moves back to e8, and you know, I don't really have much of an attack anymore. I decide now I probably need to just get rid of some of their potential pieces. So here, they with an attack on the queen, take with bishop, capture, so I trade knight for a bishop. That's okay, not too bad. At least they don't have the bishop pair. Uh, but now they capture, queen's out, Knight's out, I don't really like this, but I can infiltrate with my queen, uh, with check, they try to bring the queen forward, I didn't really want to trade this way, so I bring my queen back out, maybe there's some opportunity to make an attack. They now develop the, they now develop the bishop, uh, which means potentially, you know, uh, the rook on this side uh, covers the back rank. Hmm. Knight forward, thinking knight here, and then potentially again attacking uh, abilities once again. However, queen here with an attack, and you know, I don't want to take this way, obviously. I thought about bringing the queen all the way back with check, but the problem is, is that the king can then move to, uh, to f7. And with the queen in that position, it'll be under attack by the rook, uh, it's defended. Look, I could potentially give a check, but that doesn't really achieve, uh, you know, achieve very much. Uh, eventually, I'm gonna have to bring the queen all the way to h3. That's the only square along that diagonal that's not defended. And queen on h3, that just looked a little bit sad. So here, of course I said, don't want to take this way, rather I want them to take me. So knight forward, defending the queen, Stockfish reckons that was better, I'm not so sure about that. They capture the queen, they trade queens, good for them, trade down, I take back, and now with the attack, I move the knight out. And in this position, black is obviously ahead. They are up a full piece. However, even though Stockfish thinks I'm completely losing, and I am definitely losing, I knew in the game I was losing, I do have some compensation. The king is kind of exposed in the center. Obviously can't castle anymore. You know, these pawns, they're not exactly controlling the center. My pawn structure is pristine, while they've got, you know, uh, one pawn island, second pawn island, that's an isolated uh, e-pawn, and a third pawn island. So, you know, that's not a great pawn structure. And so I thought, look, maybe I still have a chance. But the way I'm going to potentially draw back into a situation where, where I'm at least equal is I need to try to avoid trading pieces if I can. I need to try to get my king to safety. I need to try to make use of, you know, tactics like pins and potentially skewers and forks. Uh, partic particularly if I could end up winning back material, but also importantly, winning back numerical piece. Uh, equality. What do I mean by that? So at the moment, black has one, two, three, four, five pieces, and I've got one, two, three, four. If I can get the game back to four pieces versus four pieces, even if 
that means that black has a superior pieces. You know, they, they still have their rook pair. I give up a rook for two pieces. That's still possibly good for me because the numerical number of pieces actually makes a difference towards an end game. All right, so they develop. Don't really want to trade here. However, I wasn't too sure what was the best thing to do. So I decided to actually, I just want to develop so I can potentially castle my king in either direction. Here, the first indication to me that um, that black is has got a material loss aversion. Because if you think about what's, what should black strategy be, what should they do tactically? They should try to trade. They should trade pieces, trade down to an end game. If they maintain the numerical piece superiority, I'll end up with just pawns, and they'll have pawns and a piece. And that is very difficult uh, for me to win. They're almost certainly going to be winning in that situation. So they should just have taken right away. So this is the first indication to me that they're hesitant with losing pieces, even though that's the right thing to do. All right. I now, um, I now uh, long castles, okay? So potentially with an attack, what are they gonna do? They take, I take back, and again, they do not take, they do not trade rooks. They've got a material peace loss aversion. And this is really useful for me. And this is sort of psychological uh, tactics and psychological planning you may need to make. This probably means that as long as I don't force the issue, even with the rooks looking at each other, meaning I can keep my rook looking at their rook, as long as I don't force the issue, they're probably not going to take if they think they can lose their rook. That gives um, my rooks a lot more freedom of movement. So here, I of course, I don't want to trade. I move my bishop back, okay? And the idea is I want to tr potentially try to hassle that knight. Push the knight back. The knight's not a long-range piece, and so if I can, if I can push it back, uh, potentially block off that dark square diagonal, it's dark square diagonal, it's like their pieces aren't exerting influence in the game. Again, their best move is probably just to trade. Here, uh, looks like they've got an idea that they can attack with these pawns. However, three versus three, Unless they marshal their pieces, it's not really going to work. All right, push that knight forward, defended, so I can do a battery. Okay, black should take. They should take, and yet they don't. They move the pawn again. Now I have a battery. Now I have a battery, and even with, and with the battery, they choose to not take. They still don't take, and here. This was potentially a mistake, all right? So push, I'm gonna kick the knight. They should probably take, but they don't. Oh, yo, actually, uh, Stockfish reckons, you know, counter-attacking, yep, counter-attacking the rook. I'll let their knight be taken, potentially, because they can trade material. Trading material is good for them. However, by pushing this back, it blocks that dark square diagonal, and now they lose a pawn. Uh, Bishop captures a pawn, now potentially almost even with a fork. Now Stockfish reckons capturing here is best. Again, I want to maintain my rooks. Without my rooks, I have a withering, you know, a game of attrition. I want to maintain my rooks for the opportunity to equalize. Again, they probably should capture. Here, they give a check, that's fine. You can see, Stockfish says they should capture. This was another mistake because I now take another pawn for free. This is now a passed pawn. All right, so they're trying to line things up on my, um, potentially on that, uh, on that uh, C pawn, C2, but I can push forward, no attack. Now they're trying to rotate their knight, that's fine, uh, but now I jump forward and I've now got a target of that E7 pawn. Uh, so this is a focus of mine now. I do admit as I move forward, I don't make the best use of that. But here, black, I've got a counterattack. And look, you know, the disadvantage is starting to shrink. All right, bishop out. Okay, now with an attack. So they're trying to defend. They're defending the bishop. Okay, that's fine. Here, I've got an attack on that last pawn. So that pawn's going to be nerfed at some point. 
rotating the knight. That uh, that was not the best move. They should have uh, defended that pawn again. I attack the knight. Knight jumps forward here, and that is a mistake. And notice we are now equal. Uh, that higher depth, it's equal. However, I needed to have found this move because the knight is trapped. It cannot go anywhere uh, without basically being stuck. You know, I suppose it could come over here, but basically then it's a and it's basically just out of the game. It's not really achieving anything. All right, but instead, you know, I was focused on that uh, e pawn. So here we go. Three attackers now. They finally give a defender. Uh, I attack the bishop. Stockfish says I should have just taken that pawn at this point. They bring that bishop with the attack. Here I capture. They take. That is a mistake. And you can see equal again. I can capture back. And here they capture this way. And it's a serious mistake. Now I can see what they were doing. I can see that we're thinking, oh, if I take it this way, then bang, you know, uh, absolute fork, they win my rook, and black completely wins. However, you know, I, I saw that trick. I wasn't fooled, though what I didn't see was here, I am winning. And a winning tactic was difficult to see. It is Bishop immediately captures the e7 pawn. You think that doesn't make any sense. It looks like a desperate move. Defender two ways. Take with the rook with an attack on my rook. I take, they take back, and then suddenly rook to e4, and it is a fork of the king and bishop. And no matter what they do, I win the bishop next turn, and then we end up with a rook and pawn endgame where I have an outside pass pawn. Pawn majority of this on this side, three versus two, completely winning. So that was available to me, but I didn't see it. I saw their trap, but I didn't see the potential winning attack that I had myself. Instead, I moved the king forward, so king here. You can see that was the best move. They now attack here, here, defend the bishop with a pawn, um, and now they bring the knight to d4. And here, I thought, well done, player of the black pieces, well done, mad carrot. I thought they had practically created a mating net. Because what I was thinking is um, rook here with check, uh, they cover the entire second rank. The knight covers that square, that forces the king to one of these two squares. On the back rank, and I'm thinking a oh, rook e1 that will be mate. Uh, the thing I didn't see, I sort of calculated this, and I thought, oh no, I'm losing. The thing I didn't calculate was that last move doesn't work because it's defended by my bishop. So this was actually completely fine. I wasn't losing, and I had an opportunity now to actually to pay, play a rook, um, uh, to play, yep, rook to uh, this position, uh, rook. A, A7, once again, with that very, very powerful attack on the E7 pawn. That's what I should have done. I didn't see that. Instead, because I thought I was losing, I thought I had to sacrifice my rook for the knight. Uh, obviously, that is a mistake. <laughs> it's a blunder. And I would say this is my first true blunder of the game. So that original bishop sacrifice on F7 with check, obviously that's a technical blunder, but that was deliberate. That was a, you know, that was basically a gambit to try to play a really, you know, uh, really sort of interesting romantic line. And this wasn't, this was a straight up mistake, a blunder. They take, and I knew once again I was losing. Rook and bishop versus rook and rook. Rook and rook should be more powerful. However, rook and bishop does synergize in a way that it can be tricky for a rook pair to defend against. Because the rooks can only go in the cardinal directions, you know, up and down, left and right. Or bishop slices through the diagonals, and it can be a little bit difficult for rooks to defend against that. So my goal really here now is that you know is there, is look, try to get a fork if you can. I've got an outside pass pawn in a long term. Push that up if possible. Though that's going to be pretty hard to achieve against two rooks. If there's an opportunity for threefold repetition and a draw, that's what I should aim for. So that's my thinking. Check king. Check kings. Yep. So here. 
Not so easy for them to check me now, but they can sort of smother me. That doesn't achieve a whole lot. That's defended, you know, two ways. That's fine. But I decided to move the king forward because I want to potentially get that pawn up. Check. King forward again. All right. Not so easy. So here they try to you know, double up and just goes to show how difficult rook in games are. It's a blunder. Here we've got 0, 0, 0, meaning we can force a draw. All right. They left that. I capture. Next bishop move, potentially with check. King forced to move, so I win a bit of tempo. Bring the bishop all the way back, so that's a unit. Here, they want to trade, I'm not trading. Here, they want to potentially do something like this, I give a check. These pawns become useful. King push back, and here, that was the important move, that's why, you know, that, that, that's why that's an excellent move. They only had one of two possible moves, and if they were uh, played, you know, a little bit carelessly, that would have been a very, very lovely fork, and I would be winning. However, they played the correct move, which is that. However, still have a check. King now to the back rank. Not much I can do. Attack their pawns. They give a check back. Here, they attack my, my rook. I decide to give another check. They move back to the back rank. Here, I move here. So here... Uh, potentially, I think, you know, they're looking at maybe trying to do some sort of attack like that. Um, I move my bishop a little bit out of the way, uh, basically disconnecting a potential sort of attack down like that. They've got an attack here. That's fine. I attack their pawn. They defend. That's okay. I give a check. They're here. Very important. I don't allow the king to infiltrate. So, g4. Pawns form a force field. King locked to this side of the board. Okay, these three ranks, potentially there's a uh, threefold repetition by forcing repeat recurrent checks. All right, they take, that's fine. Check, forward, check, down, check, up, check. Threefold repetition, and we draw. Uh, now, when I spoke to some Mad Carrot afterwards, they weren't actually aware of the threefold repetition rule. Uh, nonetheless, this is potentially a way. You can pull back from a completely losing uh, position, try to end the draw. It's actually really satisfying when you get it. Good game. GG. The big takeaway from this game is that you probably shouldn't play that bishop sacrifice tactic in the Von Hennig Gambit. There just isn't quite enough power, just not enough juice in the attack to make it work. I hope you enjoy this video and thanks for watching.